Hi, Mr. Mustafa. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Awesome. So, my name is Ralph from City Rates, and I'll just give you a few minutes to introduce yourself and where you're from. Okay, so my name is Mustafa Seydou. I work for Nature and Development Foundation, a uh, non governmental organization. Office is, the office is based at the University of Ghana campus. Um, I don't know what else you want me to say. What, what else you want me to say? I mean, that's, that's, that's me. Um, I've been working in the sector for quite some time now, probably like 16 years now. Uh, work on forestry issues and yeah, deal a lot with the forestry commission and related agencies. Awesome. So, yeah, speaking of for forest related issues, there's a lot for us to uncover. And just to jump straight in, so you you are with NDF, right? Could That's you tell correct. Us a bit more about NDF. So NDF stands for Nature and Development Foundation. So you can find us on ndfwestafrica.org so for more details. But like I said, uh, we are a conservation organization. We are, we are formed from uh, our association with WWF. WWF is a big conservation organization. Uh, and we were formed almost a decade ago, 2014, uh, to work on forestry, agri, wildlife, uh, and related issues. And normally when I say related issues, we talk about the biodiversity conservation, water protection, and all the issues, land-based issues, really. Uh, like I said in the beginning, our office is based at the University of Ghana campus, specifically the Department of Conservation Sciences. Uh, our office is just again in there. And yeah, so that's where we can be located. Our mission as NDF, which stands for Nature and Development Foundation, is how development or nature conservation can complement development. Oftentimes, uh, we see as if uh, conservation is one thing and development is another thing. But really, the two have and can and should complement each other. And that's what we stand for. Okay, great. So with what you stand for, there was uh, an event not too long ago the stakeholders engagement on the policy implication of li2462 so would you be able to elaborate on what that legislature is about and um, what your some of your concerns are okay so um that stakeholder engagement was organized by ourselves in collaboration with arucha ghana uh, wakam and Os osfam and it was meant to bring to fore the issues and implications policy-wise and the resource-wise of LI-2462. LI-2462, the full name is Environmental Protection to Bracket Mining and Forest Reserve Regulations 2022 LI-24. 62. That law came into force on 25th of November 2022. And what that law was passed or was, or was yeah, initiated by the Minister of Environment, Science and Technology under the advice of the EPA board uh, based on the EPA law. And basically what the law says is that, in summary, it grants access to my forest reserves. Um, it grants access to my forest reserves with the requirement that you should get approval and, and, and a permit 
from the minister and from other institutions. But basically what it did is to grant access to the forests there, which hitherto were restricted from any uh, incompatible activities without the consent of, of, the, of the chief executive. Uh, and then it purports, it purports to uh, provide, provide for the management of the fallout, environmental management of, of the fallout from that mining. And also provides for some penalties for infringement, which are which are bizarre anyway. They are bizarre. So in summary, this is what the law is about. Okay. And could you also elaborate on how the law led to people basically encroaching or targeting some of our um, revered sites? So for example, the big one that got trending was the Kakuna, Kakuna Shampa. Shampa, yeah. How how did that happen? So you you will know if you I think if you Google Google Map of Ghana, if you have look at the Google Map of Ghana, you realize that our western border, western half, not western border, western half, the middle part of the Ghana just ran perpendicular. You know, throughout to the length of Ghana to say um, uh, Burkina Faso to Mali, there's gold running throughout. You know, throughout the the length in, the length of Ghana, the from the western part to the middle part. So a lot of our forest reserves, uh, just like the off reserves, the there is some gold underneath. And therefore, this law, by granting or giving the permission for anybody to apply to mine in forest reserve, what it means is that uh, the law does not give restriction which forest reserve cannot be mined. And so if I'm sitting somewhere and I have interest in mining gold, the law basically says that irrespective of the land use, whether it's a forest reserve or whatever it is, I can apply for a land since to mine. And mind you, forest reserves are managed by the Forest Commission. So when you mine, you are not destroying, you are not destroying people's crop. And so you don't have to deal with communities and, and encompassing them and all of those things because the resources are managed by government. So if government itself is giving the resource out, those are the easiest place to deal with because there are no many communities. So Kakum, invariably, like I said, there may be some gold in there. So, and if there are no restrictions as to where you can mine in this country, the company just found that it is not illegal to apply to mine Kakum. And that's what they did. So, and it's not just Kakum. I think the biggest, like you said, the biggest one was Kakum because Kakum is such a treasured in terms of the tourism part. But there are so many other forest reserves which has already been given out. Eight of them and another 40, including Kakun, that were the application in respect of those areas were still, were still being evaluated by the Minerals Commission. Otherwise, all of them, and, and I say this, all, all the forests have 200 of them, over 200 of them are open, are open for application to mine in them. All of them by the provisions of LI 2462. So following that, um, some of the places that have been encouraged on, how exactly does it work? Because for Kakum, I read somewhere they can only mine up to about 25, 24% of the area. Is that something which is part of the law? And how does it work for the ones who have already received licenses? Okay, so... 
The law does not give restrictions as to the size of a forest reserve that can be given. In fact, 100% of the forest reserve can be mined. And if they give part of it to one company to mine, it does not preclude them to give another part to another company to mine. So this is how it works. A company says, uh, I am applying, he submits an application uh, to say, I want to mine this area, say Kakum National Park, and this is the size, say it is about, so let's say it is about um, uh, 100 hectares or 200 acres of land that I want to mine. And they will pick the coordinates as part of the application. They submit it to the, to the Minerals Commission. So Mineral Commission can decide whether they grant all of it or they don't grant all of it. So when you saw that the 24% of the Kaku National Park was going to be granted, it was the coordinate they submitted to Mineral Commission that we picked the coordinate and when we plotted it, that application was covering 24% of the Kaku National Park. But indeed, they could have even applied for the whole of the Kaku National Park and not just 24%, because there's no law that restricts them on the size of the area they could apply for. And I know in some of your speeches, you, you were basically upset about the fact that this was even possible at all. And can we touch... Um, so, Minister, uh, Mineral Commission came out and said they are not going to... First of all, they've, denied, they've declined the application and they've also committed not to permit anyone to even apply for specifically Kaku. And I just want to know, how, how does this affect the other um, areas and basically what's being done about the law is it going to be on a an individual basis of okay we are not going to touch this one yeah and then the rest are still so you, available yeah so you see the mischief the law as we have concluded is a bad law a law that gives you the power to convert all your forest reserves into mine pits is a bad law so you we organized a stakeholder engagement on Thursday. On Saturday, the Mineral Commission came to say they have rejected that application. Since when was it prior to the engagement or it was after that? And and to say we are not granting so, is it because, actually, yeah. I think you had your engagement on a Saturday, I think. No, on a Thursday. On a Thursday. On a Thursday. Yeah. So I saw the report on on a Saturday. Yes, on a Saturday. And our account, we, we tweeted about it on, I think, on a Sunday. Yes. And on um, on that Sunday, we tweeted it Sunday morning and Sunday evening is when Mineral Commissions came out with their reply. So I was actually surprised that they work on Sundays. Yeah, so that's surprising. <laughs> so that's surprising. So the, the, the good part is that we think that the engagement is achieving results particularly with respect to, to um, Kakun, for all that you know, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if nobody had brought this into light, they would have just gone ahead to issue the money uh, license to Kakun. The thing is that most people would not be on the side, on the, on the part, on the part of Kakun where the money would have been taking place. Because normally when we visit Kakun, we are just on the, on the periphery where, uh, people go to climb the the what's it called the the you go and climb the canopy the canopy walkway. Yeah. So we don't really walk so deep into it. So you wouldn't have yeah. seen it. You probably would have seen cars moving around. Yes. So I think that it's good thing. But I mean, why why only limit the rejection to only Kakum? Is it because Kakum why? Is it because people are making noise about Kakum? Or Kakum is more treasured than any of any of the other reserves? 
you know, so that tells you that if we don't make noise, if we don't make, and uh, I'm not, I'm not quoting the Gabonese president, but what I mean is that if we don't resist this law, if we don't act and 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 and, and a request for the repeal of this law, in fact, our national parks. Moli National Park or any other protected area in this country is not safe from the law. And now I wonder, if we have a forestry commission which is responsible for managing the forest resources, and they are managing the forest resources based on the forest reserves that are there, and at the same time, you open up, you give the power to mineral commission to be able to grant mineral licenses or the minister to grant mineral licenses to the same forest reserve, then what's the relevance of forestry commission in the first place? The second point is that the forest industry, the team, the wood we get, they're all coming from the forest reserve. And you know, there's no way you can do surface mining and then still have the trees standing in the same place. So eventually you still have to cut, you have to cut them down. And the law does not receive how much of the area you give out anyway. So all that we need is to have a very, um, a very unreasonable minister who says that I'm acting under the authority of the law. The law does not restrict me. And I give everything out for mining. What do you say about that? So the whole of the timber industry, the forest industry, not timber industry, the forest industry, is it is is under threat? The whole of the Forestry Commission is under threat. The system of Forestry Commission is under threat. The whole of the the study of forestry and related matters in KUST is rendered um, unattractive by this law. And I think all our international engagement, and then you have heard recently. In June every year, they come to say we are greening Ghana. Which policy, which reason, reasonable policy will allow the degradation, legal degradation, not illegal, legal degradation of your forest? And you turn around as the same ministry or the commission and say you are planting. Which law will say we are issuing a legal timber which in the long run will lead to sustainable forest management. But at the same time, you are issuing money leases to convert those forests to mine pit anyway. You are in COP, COP in the Conference of Parties of Climate Change, UNF, UNFCC, uh, Conference of Parties. They're going to have one end of this month in Dubai. And I'm very sure our minister will be taunting the, the good achievement we have made under the forest sector. We are planting this. We are protecting it. But it's all a shambles. I mean, you can't pretend to be protecting your forest when you have opened them up for mining. There's no sustainable mining that is compatible with forest, res forest reserve management unless it is not a surface mining. So I think this law undermines international relationship, undermines the existence of forestry commission, undermines the soul of the, the whole of the forest industry, and, and it undermines the study of forestry as an academic institution, and, and, and it's just a bad law, to say the least. Yes, it is a bad law, and I know you've been working hard towards trying to get it repealed, and I think it would be good if you could also share what can basically the youth or the general public do to get this law repealed or abolished completely. I think um, we are drafting a petition to be sent to the presiden presidency uh, requesting them to repeal the law because, you know, it's an executive act. Uh, but it is an executive action that the law is, is made. So it is only the executive which can send it to parliament for it to be repealed. And therefore, we are sending a petition.
I will look whether we can open this up for a lot more signatories uh, so that it will add more weight to it. But on our part, yes. we are we are we drafting. We have uh, our colleague drafting uh, a, a memo, a petition. We are not taking off the table the legal action to get uh, a view of courts whether the law itself is is in, illegitimate because. It is made under a law that cannot carry it. So we'll test that as well. But of course, if the executive is taking action to repeal it, we may not take the action, the legal action, but uh, they are both on the table. But as well, we want the public to be aware of this. And indeed, and indeed, let me just mention this. And I tell people all the time, the reason why cocoa does not grow in the Accra Plains, even though it's in the southern part of Ghana, and cocoa does not grow in the north is because of forest. You know, we don't have forest in the Accra Plains. We don't have forest in the in the in the in the northern part of Ghana. In fact, a significant part of the of the uh, the eastern part of Ashanti and eastern region, we don't grow cocoa there because it has all been turned into grassland and there's no forest. So if we are taking this forest away. That forest is necessary for the macroclimate that is good for cocoa. And this country is so reliant on, on, on cocoa that I, don't, I, I can't just even imagine that we'll be doing things that are contrary to the sustainability of yes. the cocoa industry. I just can't imagine. Speaking of cocoa, we are aware cocoa is around um, 45 years all-time highs um, in terms of price, but then Cocoa Board is still struggling with, with uh, paying the farmers. Do you have any information or insights on that? Like yeah. On the ground? yeah, that one has nothing to do with this law, but it has a lot to do with our economic situation. I'm very sure because every year they do syndicated loan uh, where a number of banks come together to finance our pitches. So if they are finding it difficult to raise the for to pay farmers is, is most likely that they are not able to raise that syndicated loan that they used to do every year. Because, and of course, you should understand if people, if you are owning and you are not able to pay, <laughs> if you go back to go and, and borrow, the, 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 the lender will be very cautious, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, so that they, that may well explain it, but that has nothing to do with this law. But, but I think that. This law in future will, will just destroy all our international relations with respect to forestry. Yeah. And I saw, um, I think with Germany, we received about $130 million recently to tackle climate change. And it's very interesting that we are trying to solve it using technology like solar. Meanwhile, with our natural forest reserves, we are still passing laws which are more aggressive and doing the opposite so um yeah actually actually we receive a lot of money from the world bank for protecting our forests uh for carbon for carbon uh, carbon and to continue protecting our forests so i don't know what they are thinking is in terms of what this law is and that's why we we want to make everybody aware of this law uh the the diplomacy of the date does not allow some of the diplomatic communities and international organizations to to openly uh, criticize the host country. Uh, but I'm very sure a lot of them don't like this law. And if they see the implication of it uh, and they read to it, I'm very sure there will be more engagement with government on what to do with this law. But of course, you won't hear them on radio or television. Okay, so um, we'd open the floors in case anyone has any questions. And a quick reminder, the space is recorded for those who couldn't uh, make it live. So more people will be listening after. If you have any questions, just put your hand up. And in the meantime, you spent about 30 minutes already. Yes. Uh, and what's your name again? I'm Ralph. Ralph. 
Oh, I forgot. Say it again, please. It's Ralph. Ralph. Oh, Ari, oh Ralph. Ari. Okay, Ralph. Yes. R- Ralph, so another thing I want to draw your attention to, uh, which is very bizarre. In fact, yesterday I was in the... I, I made a similar presentation before the Institute of Professional... Uh, the Ghana Institute of Professional For- uh, Foresters. Ghana Institute of Foresters. And I was telling them, if you look at the penalty, you know, every law, when you draft a law, especially the substantive law, the enactment, the act, there's always a, a penalty for disobeying. And that's actually what yeah. makes it a law. Under this law, if you don't obey what the law says you should be, you, do, 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 you understand, do you know the penalty that you have to pay? The maximum is, the maximum is 3,000 Ghana cities. Three thousand breaking the law. Yeah, for breaking the law, three thousand Ghana cities. Do you understand what it is to mine and you you and all that you are, you suffer when you break the law is three thousand Ghana cities. It's peanuts. In fact, <laughs> it's is it, it, it's, it's amazing that even the forestry law, when you cut down a tree, which you are not supposed to cut down, you are charged. Oh almost uh, 2,500 penalty units multiplied by 12. Uh, that will give you um, uh, that's 2,500 cities multiplied yeah. 12. Yeah. So that's basically 30,000, which is about 10 Exactly. Times. So if you cut the tree down, you suffer the penalty of 3,000. If you if you mine in the forest reserve and do anything that is contrary to this particular law, you suffer only three thousand. Why would somebody leave who be doing the logging and not go and do mining? It means that what you are telling all the industry guys in the forest logging now that they should stop the logging and come and apply for mining because the penalty for breaching the law and the mining is very is very low. It's 10 times slower than if you cut down a tree that you're not supposed to cut. Yeah. It's basically little risk with the promise of higher rewards. Exactly. That's the point. Exactly. So that's the kind of law we have. Which, which explains why someone would apply for cocoon. Because exactly. Because even if they break the laws, even if you break the law, it. he will pay. He will pay. Yes. Yeah. So that's the kind of law we have. Okay. Yeah. So, see, I think we've taken a bit of your time, and I thank you very much for making the time to speak with us. And we'll be looking forward to hearing more from you. And we'd also try and highlight as much as we can. So, I'll just give you a few more minutes if you have any last words before we end the space. Yeah. So, for me, I think that this fight is not just a civil society fight. And I'm very happy that other groups, even though they are still civil society, other groups have come on board, like the Occupy Ghana and the Media Coalition Against Galamsey, the Catholic Bishop Conference, because I know, I know a lot of times we are a bit slow to react as a country. Perhaps if you are in Accra, you think that mining is so far away from you. On the contrary, on the contrary, you are so close to the impact of mining, irresponsible mining, than any other thing. You know why? The water we drink, I know that almost everybody in Ghana either takes sachet water or bottled water, but I think that probably 90% take sachet water. Where do we get our water from? It's either from Pong or it's from Wager. Wager takes its source from the Atua forest and passes through a lot of tributaries where there are a lot of mining. The heavy metals that you avoid to drink because, and you drink the sachet water. But that same water that you avoided to drink directly, you are using it to cook. Who tells you that when you cook, that when you boil that water, the heavy metals are deactivated? They are not. The, the, the chemicals of mercury and arsenic, they have the capacity to enter the food chain. And indeed, they do enter the food chain. And if anybody is doing research about the food we are eating in Accra, 
a lot of them have the heavy metals and you see where the food is coming from the plantains and all of that we are in Accra and then we are eating them so if you think that you are too far away from the mine uh, the mining pits and then it's not none of your business think again it may just well be and you are and your doorsteps and it is not surprising that we are having a lot of related organ related um uh malfunctions uh, and then diseases like kidney kidney has just gone up in the past few years up Boom. and we're not able to relate what is causing it. and i'm not saying directly it is the heavy metal that is causing it but i i can guess that there's high correlation with with our money activities and some of these things that we are experiencing on our health and so this is a fight everybody i know that it's not everybody who has a platform but now everybody has a phone if you're not on twitter you're on instagram you're on facebook if it is not good for it is not good for anybody it's not it, 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 it's everybody it affects it's not like it affects a particular group of people or something like that and i think that we should stand up against this you know okay and I thank you for thank you. for your activism also on the social media. Yeah, uh, it's very you, encouraging. You keep, you keep doing our best. And again, thank you for making the time. So thank you. I'm sure once again, you know, with social media, things go up and then die down. I'm yes. Sure. So come again back to people's memories and we'll do well to bring you back into the conversation. That's correct. The That's correct. Memories. Yes, yes. I will do that. Thank you, Mr. Thank you for making time. And thank you, thank you, thank you. You too. Yeah. Okay.